Here's another article, a pretty long article actually, talking about um, the old days, you know, in the men's rights movement and uh, my recollections and stories and stuff. And uh, I submitted this to uh, Transitions, the newsletter of the National Coalition for Men, and uh, Tim Golditch um, accepted it and printed it and uh, edited it for me. And um, I'd like to read it for you right now. My history with the men's rights movement. For this activist man of a certain age, 56, just, just hearing that there's a men's human rights movement is music to my ears. This is a dream come true. Finally, men are standing together and fighting for the equal rights as men. It's really happening. Those early years in the fight for men's rights were cold and lonely. Really just a few groups spread far and wide resulting in only sporadic success. Before the internet, we had protests, meetings, newsletters, and in my case, national talk show exposure. But even with that media boost, things were slow to catch fire. I think many men and women had ideas about men's rights, but could never connect or network. Now we've grown into a real movement. It's been a great ride to this point. Going from early men's rights groups to my own cable access show, and now proud men's human rights YouTuber. With your permission, please allow me to indulge myself and take you on a journey of my life in the men's rights movement. My first thoughts about unfairness were in reaction to the mindset at the time, the 80s, that women were more caring and emotional. I'm more emotional than my wife, I thought, and I'm a man, so I started thinking about feminism and where men fit in. Then I got divorced and saw firsthand how men and dads were treated by the state and family court. It seemed men also needed a movement. So when I heard this dynamic men's rights activist on the radio, I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was Mel Fight of the National Center for Men, NCM, founded in 1987, and he was organizing a rally at a war memorial in Manhattan on Veterans Day to protest the sexism of the male-only draft. Wow, I thought, I've got to be there. As an aside, um, wow doesn't really begin to describe the feeling of hearing this guy Mel fight on radio. You know, this is talk weight radio, uh, 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 AM, uh, what was it, WABC? Uh, AM radio in uh, the tri-state area of New York City. and. Uh, many thousands of people listening to that, uh, if not millions, and um, here's this guy Mel Fight, and man, he was speaking the truth, you know, the true men's rights stuff, stuff I've always been thinking, and here's this guy speaking and arguing eloquently. Well, let me get back to my article. And the great thing was that it was local to me, that this Mel Fight was local, we had signs, we shouted slogans, and most of all, I met Mel and Tony Nazaro, some real hardcore, hardcore MRAs. This is around 1990, and things were moving along nicely for uh, NCM and NCFM, also, that was formed in 1977. But Mel Fight had special talents. He knew his facts, and he had his presentation down cold. And so he became the national face of the men's rights movement, Appearing on numerous talk shows, from Donahue to Oprah to Jerry Springer when he had a serious show, I was active with I was active with NCM in its golden year, golden years when talk shows were about issues and a man who sometimes wore a skirt was cutting edge television. He came up with a consensual sex contract that would help protect men from false accusations of rape and forced parenthood, with a clause stating neither would force parenthood on the other. He also championed reproductive rights for men, at various times bringing lawsuits on behalf of plaintiffs who wanted equal rights with women, the right not to be a parent. No one could touch Mel in any discussion of men's rights or feminism, because he knew his facts and had a dramatic way of winning an argument. As an aside, I have many of these uh, talk show tapes. I can't put them up on YouTube because it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's copyrighted, obviously. But I have many of these tapes, and they're, they're great to, to review. I mean, man, he was doing it. He was doing it. But 
Without the internet, internet at the time, we could not we could not network like we're doing now. Okay, back to my article. Uh, no talk show host or opposing feminist was prepared to counter Mel's unequivocal, unequivocal logic and passionate presentation. Can you imagine the excitement watching Mel and Oprah and national television make a dramatic case for men's re reproductive rights? Millions watched. It was exhilarating. When I made appearances on these shows, usually speaking from the audience, I had people recognize me. He was one of the few people to win an argument with Gloria Allred. He got Oprah to admit a woman could have many babies while collecting child support from each dad. On Jerry Springer, Mel announced that he'd always wanted to do what he'd seen feminists do. So he stood up and announced, no woman will ever force me to be a father against my will. He remarked on the lack of, of applause by the women in the audience when Springer took the bait and told Mel to just say no and keep your pants on. Mel responded, some of the arguments against abortion were meant to punish women for having sex. Well, you've resurrected that argument from its grave where it belongs, and now you're using it against men, and you know better than that. To which astonished Springer muttered, I don't. <laughs> On the same show, he asked Melinda Power of the Women's Action Coalition, point blank. I'm going to make a strong pro-choice statement here. No person should have the right to force another person to be a parent against his or her will. Do you agree with that statement or not? To which she equivocates, equivocates, saying, Depends on what you mean by parent. And that men should still be finally responsi financially responsible. Undeter undeterred, he proclaims. Most feminists, when they say they're pro-choice, they're lying to you. They're pro-women, not pro-choice, and they think that and they think the term reproductive choice doesn't apply. I'm, I'm mangling that. I'm going to do that again. Undeterred, he proclaims, most feminists, when they say they're pro-choice, they're lying to you. They're pro-women, not pro-choice. And they think the term reproductive choice doesn't apply to people with the penises, and that makes them anti-choice hypocrites. Man, you should have seen the look she gave him. On one show about rape, he tried to explain the reasons why some men might do this, saying that some men lash out in a, out in a feeling of powerlessness. He certainly had this right, as common sense tell you, that a man who is committing rape or suicide is not a man who is feeling powerful or privileged. He also was adamant that in most of his appearances, he'd be allowed to wear a skirt, one of his in-your-face activism tactics. I love that. His point was, of course, that women have choice of what to wear. He wanted the same choice. To Jackie Mason's question on why he's wearing a skirt, he simply responds, I'm comfortable, a point to which Jackie concedes. At one appearance of his, I wore a skirt in the audience to support him, agreeing that men should also have fashion choice, but also to cheerfully invade formerly female-only territory. On one Rolanda, Mel was on stage with noted d domestic violence researcher Murray Strauss and George Gill Gilliland, who founded the first domestic violence shelter, shelter for men in the U.S., debating Charlotte Watson of My Sister's Place, Gilliland rather, confronted, confronted Watson with statistics showing that lesbian couples batter more than gay couples, which of course refutes Watson belief, Watson's belief that men need to do dominate and that it's women who are the only victims. Strauss's research shows that uh, domestic violence is perpetuated by men and women equally. Mel has also appeared on the Sally Jesse Raphael show, the Richard Bay show, Montel Williams, the, Jackson, uh, the Jackie Mason show. Mel debates Lynn Samuels on that Jackie Mason show. Maury Povich, and more recently, The View, and Dr. Phil. I also remember him uh, debating Lisa Sliwa on the Morton Downey Jr. show. One MRA that I knew from the National Center for Men, Jim Winston, he's still with them, had always espoused the rebuttable presumption of shared parenting. And in the event that a person is uncooperative, that parent loses custody. I mention him because one year, he sent me a card with a cartoon on it that I still remember. 
was the Wizard of Id, and it starts with a messenger announcing to the king, there's a men's rights activist at the gate. To which the king replies, it's about time. It was so exciting to watch Mel on a national television. Here's one great statement he made on Oprah. We men are going to get our right to reproductive freedom because women's choice depends on men's support. And if we men don't get this freedom, you'll see how fa fast men withdraw their support for women's choice. From now on, either bo both men and women will have choice or no one will. He says a lot better than me. He also told how in college he was revolted to see women protesting and claiming oppression while men were getting drafted and dying just for being men. Obvious to me. As men membership director of the National Center for Men, I saw the many letters, no emails at the time, and phone calls we would get after a national show. Many letters came from inmates who sometimes poured out their t hearts in tales of woe. We couldn't help them directly, as you know, as an advocacy group. We're all familiar with this. Our, our paid members from around the world um, received the monthly men's rights report that we mailed out from the makeshift office of Fights Home. Mel hired an answering service to handle the calls we'd re receive after one of his appearances. Each year he'd uh, host the annual NCM picnic, of which I attended just one, the last, an event that brought together the local MRAs and their families and even the answering service ladies. The picnic was at Jones Beach on Long Island, New York, with barbecues, kites, and great fun. How much difference we made is hard to say. Maybe we spurred some people on to, into activism. I know I was. I was also enthralled by, enthralled by Mel, Mel Fights activism and felt, felt lucky to be involved with him and his group. I think Mel formed NCM out of a parting of the ways with Tom Williamson, co-founder co of N NCFM, possibly relating to the skirt. I remember trying to get Tom Williamson and Naomi Penner, the other co-founder of NCFM, on my cable show. But Tom declined, saying he was more or less retired, and the, Penny, the Penner show never happened. Harry Crouch at NCFM Org has plenty of info on the early uh, men's rights movement. We engaged in many protests, some related to domestic violence. We brought our signs and t-shirts to one of those clothesline projects against domestic violence. We somewhat agreed with their cause, but we were there to say that men are also victims and females are per can be perpetrators. Some were stunned to see any opposing viewpoint, but others agreed that DV was an agenda thing. At one of our protests at the, M the Ms. Foundation in New York City against Take Your Daughter to Work Day, to point out the obvious hypocrisy of the whole idea, a camera crew and reporter interviewed me and others. I later found out that they were from Fox and Michael Moore's TV Nation. So Fox calls me and wants to do a show about the men's movement and what I like to be included. Not knowing the show involved, I thought it could be a news piece. I jumped at the chance. They asked me what I'd like to do, plan, planning to interview me while engaging in some interest of mine. I guess they sandbagged me instead of airing what I said at the protest. They tried to get me to say something stupid, which I didn't. I say this in hindsight because the segment on TV Nation tried to discredit the men's movement but by interviewing me and two others, um, hoping we'd say something uh, outlandish, which we didn't. Only when it aired did I know it was Michael Moore's show, as I never even spoke to him. He mostly trotted out the usual one-sided feminist statistics that say men were doing just fine, and he did his best to ridicule the men's movement and paint it as a bunch of angry white males. Sound familiar? This was in the 90s that Michael Moore was doing, did this. I think I made a couple of good statements, but all my reasoning went on the cutting room floor. The laugh is on them. I was in a Michael Moore production. One memorable comment I made was from the audience on the Rolanda Watch show. I think the show was titled Divorce Wars. One guest told the tale of a controlling ex-husband who owed a lot of child support and was supposedly hiding assets. It was clear to me 
if you just step back. I asked, what is the most precious thing, precious thing to come out of your marriage? To which she replied, the children. Then I said further, you're saying you're the wrong party here, while I say you're the most, you've got the most important thing of, of all, your children. Sure, she had a beef, but talk about unrecognized female, female privilege. On the same show, Mel shared the crowded stage with legal expert Jamie Colby, declaring that while the husband's role of providing continues after the divorce, the wife's role ends. I've never heard of a judge ordering a woman receiving alimony to go to her ex-husband's place to do the housework. I thought that was a great point. I always thought that was great insight. I mentioned Jamie Colby because years later I saw her, her as a newscaster on WPIX, then CNN. And now she has her own show on Fox News Channel and is an award-winning jur journalist who got a BA when she was 14 and law degree at 22. She was an entertainment lawyer for a time and was uh, Johnny Carson's lawyer for, for his divorce. All of this is the early 90s. On the show Final Take about sexual harassment, again from the audience, I asked Gloria Allred, now this, this question is coming up again, 20, 30 years later. You say sexual harassment is in the eye of the, eye of the victim. Well, would you agree with me if I said it was sexual harassment if I was offended by a woman wearing a low-cut blouse at the office? It is in your book, up to me, right? She waffled and didn't give a straight answer as only she could do. Another time I was booked as a guest on the Charles Perez show, but bumped into the audience when I, they realized it was more serious than sensational. Daytime talk television was no longer an outlet for serious discussion of important issues. <clears throat> In the late 90s, I, fa I found NCFM and became active with them for many years. In 2002, I started broadcasting a local men's rights talk show from Long Island, New York, which lasted for about four years. That was on a, ca a cable access show. I tackled all the standard topics, circumcision, the draft, reproductive rights, divorce, paternity, fraud, and many others. I remember airing the campaign song, Warren Farrell for Governor, written by NCFM member, member Mark Sutton, when Farrell actually ran for California Governor. I had as a guest Steve Sabota from the attorney, Attorneys for the Rights of the Child, ARC, and S and also from S NCFM to do some shows on circumcision and men's rights. I recorded an early NCFM uh, Greater New York chapter meeting for two shows. I had doctors, lawyers, activists, and regular people on the show to discuss men's issues, as well as the occasional on-location protest footage. <clears throat> you could find all those shows at uh, my YouTube channel, Buck Dharma, B-U-C-K space Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A. One score I made was getting a letter published in the syndicated column, Single File, on the topic of men's re reproductive rights, which was well, re well received by Susan Dietz, saying, read his logic and then reread it before passing judgment. To my amazement, keeping this whole issue alive, my ex-wife gets her own letter published in rebuttal, taking it personal, which it wasn't. Imagine seeing a letter in the paper signed, your name here's ex-wife. On March 4th, 2013, some cool intactivists and I pulled off an amazing protest. We interrupted a Clinton Foundation Millennium Network talk at, at uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York, standing and chanting, stop exploiting Africans, and circumcision does not stop AIDS, to protest the misguided efforts to circumcise millions of African men to stop AIDS. Stunning the audience, Bill, Chelsea, and actor and Ed Norton. Already there's been good press on the internet about our action and a lot of intelligent comments. Seeintaction.org. That's who um, um, organized that. The plan was to attend the Clinton Foundation talk by buying tickets and sitting together in the orchestra, and then donning the bloodstained men jumpsuits, white with bloodstained crotch, while seated, then standing while zipping up the jumpsuits. Anthony on my right, the head blood-stained man, would nudge us to put on our suits and stand, holding, heads in a, holding hands in a spread eagle, eagle position to signify the strapping down of a baby boy while he blew a whistle to get everyone's attention, and then we'd start our chants. 
Then we got the nudge and stood up. Four of us, holding hands and started chanting, Stop exploiting Africans. And circumcision does not stop AIDS, which we changed to condoms, not cutting. Bill, Bill Clinton responded with, Okay, you guys had your chance to speak, now it's my turn. And then citing the discredited 60% HIV reduction rate argument, we were still chanting, but ready to exit, so I took a parting shot, telling the Clintons that circumcising Africans would only encourage them not to use condoms and ultimately cause more AIDS deaths. We figured we made our point, <clears throat> so we started our exit, and to my amazement, no one really was pushing us out, but they did make sure that we did leave the press, all left the premises. We were elated how it all went, slapping each other in the back on the way out, Glad to have made our point, not gotten arrested. We were, however, approached by what turned out to be two Secret, Serv Secret Service agents who asked if we were anti-Clinton, if we had a leader or organization, to which I wasn't volunteering any information. They were actually friendly and said they appreciated that we were well-behaved and didn't try to stay and cause trouble, and mainly that we were simply a group of passionate activists. Because this is my personal experience with the men's movement, much activism went unnoticed to me. I knew of Glenn Sachs and his, and the His Side radio show, other fathers' rights groups, Angry Harry, and Men's News Daily, but I wasn't active, losing interest when Mel dropped out of sight. Glenn lost his show, and Dad's on the Air from Australia disappeared. The NCFM New York chapter closed, and I stopped producing my cable show. But we, meanwhile, the MRM uh, was growing, transforming, and flourishing online. Years of this growth have produced fruit. The esteemed NCFM and newcomer AVFM are burning up the internet with renewed vigor and popularity. Reinforcements in a struggle that build upon the previous achievements with even more passionate, smart, and talented people. Now with the internet, the MHRM is finally getting the spotlight it deserves. Men and women now have a voice and are freely expressing their opinions about men's rights. I always knew that eventually the truth had to come out, and now the beginnings of a tidal wave of MHRAs of all flavors are, flavors are coming together and flooding the internet with their blogs, comments, radio shows, and YouTube videos. I'm sure you notice also the lack of favor, fav, favorable comments to, to feminist blogs and articles. Many are negative comments by insightful MHRAs. In the real world, they don't have a following, except for themselves. We're also slowly creeping, probably the wor wrong word to use, into the mainstream media. This will only increase as it did on the internet, because the will of the people and the truth itself cannot be hidden forever. I'm relieved to know that this moment is here, this movement is here to stay, and growing every day, and seeing the young MHRAs in our midst, glends my heart that we're on our way to justice and compassion for all. Well, here's to more successes in the men's rights movement. Take care.